Candace Michelle, and this is Our Community. I'm delighted to welcome Diana Carter, the Executive Director of Brookings Core Response, back to the show. Hi, Diana, and welcome back. It's always great to see that yeah. face. <laughs> yeah, it's, I know. I haven't seen Tom in a minute. I've seen you, but I haven't seen Tom in a minute. So, But I haven't seen you right. this way Not on the other side of the mic. Yes, yeah. exactly. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, it's nice to be in here. And a lot happens. You know, I've... I've <laughs> No, right? I mean, I'm I'm always surprised at how fast the yeah. time is going. Yeah. You know? I mean, I I remember when I was a kid and it seemed like summer lasted forever. Mm-hmm. I mean, just forever. Yeah, it's gone. Exactly. It's gone. Right we're in September I, now. I know. And I remember being really glad when it was getting to the end of summer because as much fun as I had I wanted to get back to school and see my friends, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, all that stuff. I can't, I, this summer is just, I don't know what to say. Yeah. It's like it was gone before it even started. Where did the time go? <laughs> I know. <laughs> I always think if somebody actually can find out where the time I goes. <laughs> it's where, it's going wherever those missing socks are from the dryer, I assume. Oh. Do you have those missing socks? Yeah, too? I don't know where they're at, but <laughs> if we find them, I think we'll find the time. I did find one of mine in the garbage because I know That's that nice. there's a garbage can between my washing machine oh, and yep. my dryer. Oh, that'll do it. And it clearly dropped into the garbage can, either with me loading it into the washing machine or taking it out and loading it into the dryer. They're, they're probably, all of our missing socks are probably just sitting underneath of our dryer. I think. Oh, I didn't under. even think yeah. to look. <laughs> I bet there's a way to get into that that I'll never know. <laughs> oh, I love it. Yeah. Anyway, I, I feel like, you know, I, I blink my eyes anymore and an entire month is gone. Yeah, I, know. <laughs> so I just don't know how that I don't know how that happens. So uh, I know that, you know, you've got a couple of quick updates about your projects, Mm -hmm. and that's really exciting. Um, The one that that stands out in my brain, of course, was the ribbon cutting. Yeah, that was great. Pure House Navigation Center. That was so awesome. I really like, I mean, I'm not an event planner, that's for sure. I wear a lot of hats, but that's not one that I (laughs) wear. Yeah. Um, and so really most of the team helped out with that. You know, Sandy in housing, she did a lot of like organizing and, you know, I think Francis arranged the food and certainly Cindy and June were running all around and Kathleen. So, you know, everybody put in a lot of work on that and I, I, I maybe, you know, I gave a speech. Um, no, I did. That's what too. you're supposed to do, though. As the executive director, you're yeah. really not the one that's supposed to be running around making sure that the napkins are out. Yeah, well, you know, that's new. But I can't, I, like, can't even do it anymore. So it's it's wonderful to have, like, all these people that are just so well-equipped and amazing. Great yeah, they really are. Yeah. yeah. I'm, like, so blessed. Uh, and not only was there catered food, but you had a live band. I know. Steve, our health programs manager, was he was in Bloodline, and he's left now. He's went to Minnesota. And we're, as sad as we are, there were definitely a lot of tears. There still are sometimes. Yeah. You know, it's, yeah. He sat right across from me, you know, for the better part of a year. So it's kind of weird now. You look over there and he's yeah, not there. Yeah, like know. Cindy and I are both really short. Um, mm-hmm. And so, you know, we have to kind of peek over the monitors. And with, you know, when, when I was sitting across from Steve, I just look up and he's right there. And, um, you know, tall guy always grabbed the stuff off the, t- the shelves exactly. for us. Exactly. do without him. so useful. Seriously. <laughs> um, but no, he was just, I mean, amazing and helping put together. He was with us for two years almost. And, you know, he really did a lot of the work putting together our, our resource navigation program and just um, all of our health programs. And like it, health programs are such a different beast than housing programs. Mm. Housing programs are a beast because it's federally funded. It's state funded. It's all this like, it's just, it bogs you down. You know, right. it's, it's, it's a lot of, you know, federal stuff. There's a lot of um, I do. paperwork involved <laughs> yes. and they like reams of it. They love yeah. one tree for every, um, you know, grant. Absolutely. So, so yeah, the, but the housing programs, they're, you know, they've all been around for a long time. They were set by the federal government in the 80s and the 70s and all that. So there's really not, you know, they're they're difficult to understand. But once you do, they're they're same year after year after year. There's very minor changes. Mm-hmm. Um, 
health programs, when you're trying to address the social determinants through health, um, it's it's so many factors, you know, it's and it's so difficult sometimes to put together a program that really works because it's different for everybody. Housing, it is different for everybody, but, you know, you can kind of have an established protocol and kind of go through that with each person and find a lot of success. You know, when it comes to just general case management, think of all the things you need in life that are not housing related. You know, you need to go to your doctor. You've got to get your car fixed. You've, there's just all these things. Mm-hmm. Those are the things that, you know, resource navigation, it's like, here's housing, here's everything else, and sometimes housing. And so we're trying to address health through the social determinants, which is called the social determinants of health. And that is the, the, you know, social determinants of health is basically the um, place that we live, grow, work, um, volunteer, you know, go to school, it's it's the community that we live in and that we get all of these needs met. And so the community resources, what's available to us in our community, makes up this net um, of, of resources that any person might need at one time. And that's called the social determinants of health. So mm-hmm. all of these social aspects of your community determine how healthy you are. So we can actually look up um, zip codes and determine what an average lifespan would be in certain zip codes. Wow. Because they've determined... In this area, um, the social determinants, you know, uh, are like there's this is a food desert here. There's so it's higher risk of diabetes. You know, they they can determine all these things from census and studies and all that. So so the social determinants of health is really complex. It's, you know, it's addressing your life through getting an ID, through getting, I mean, just getting a job. And, And you don't think necessarily that, you know, getting an ID for instance, wouldn't right. necessarily be that big a deal. Or improve your health, maybe. Right. Yeah. But but if you've got like five of them at one time that you're trying to address, yeah. that can get a little prickly. Yeah, yeah. And and some, you know, someone comes in and they need an ID and a birth certificate and they need to um, get their um, vehicle registered or they need to get a phone and then, you know, the next appointment, someone's coming in with a domestic violence situation and they're in danger or, you know, they've they're actively running from something. And so uh, we it, it just from each appointment to each appointment, it's so different, um, so much more so than than housing. And, you know, Steve really just did an incredible job at yep. navigating this and figuring out, OK, we're seeing a lot of this. This is what we need right here. And, you know, for a long time, uh, he when he, he came in, you know, he asked a lot of questions because he there was uh, a lot to, to learn about how health programs in general and resource navigation. Um, and, you know, at first he was like, you know, I'm sorry, I'm asking so many questions. And I just said, like, hey, you know, we all do. And at some point you're not going to need to ask me anymore. Yep. And that'll be fine, too. Yep. And until you do, I'm here. And and there was a day, yeah, where he just he I just realized like you know what he's he's really not coming to me anymore, yeah. and he just uh, he was he he learned um, how I wanted things done, and then he was able to make those decisions, and he really just took off. And then Laura came on under him, and they were such a phenomenal team. Like I know Laura really struggled. Um, with Steve leaving. And by the way, he's he's going on to bigger and better things. He's going to be studying for his RN in uh, Minnesota at the Mayo, Cl- Mayo Clinic. Excellent. Yeah. So that's, so that's he's, awesome. Yeah. yeah. We're, we're very happy for him. Yeah. We're just sad for us. Sometimes. We're sad for us. Yes. Um, <laughs> and him and his family, they're going to have such a good time over there. Yeah. I, I yeah. hope so. Yeah. I, I've already seen a few pictures, so yeah. I'm excited. Um, so yeah, we, we brought someone on. Um, to kind of fill mm-hmm. that, in. That's our new health good. programs manager. And Good. You know, he doesn't have a lot of health care experience, but he's just such a solid person. And I Excellent. think he's going to be a great part of the team once we get him up to speed. So tell me what a navigation center does. Yeah. So a navigation center, I mean, it's it's definitely oh, what it sounds like. We're basically when people are coming in, you know, they come in and they have a goal, um, but maybe they don't know how to get to that goal or maybe they do know how to get to that goal, but there's a few things. Um, steps along the way that they can't do on their own. And so navigation is we're just coming alongside them and kind of scaffolding them 
um, when they need mm-hmm. it. And sometimes we're just um, coming alongside them and we're just kind of an ear. And, you know, maybe they are just like, they just need like $50 to get this one thing done so they can get on their way. And so sometimes it is is pretty short and, you know, we're able to help them in a day or two. And sometimes it's it's months or even a few years. There's some mm-hmm. people we work with for years. Um, and, and in fact, there's a few people that have been coming since we we opened. And they're just now, there's a few that are just now starting to kind of come around wow. to like, maybe I do want to get clean or, mm-hmm. you know, so we... It's resource navigation is really client centered, mm-hmm. it's person led. And so if that person isn't ready for this resource, but they're ready for the other one, then that's what we're going to work on. Because you kind of have to meet people where they are. You do, or you're not going to get anywhere. Right. Um, I mean, it's the same that we do with kids, too. You can't force those things. Uh, I think I, I was reading. I saw something, maybe it was online today, that said something about, um, you know, raising children, which I attribute this to not just raising children, but to helping people navigate their life and and whatever. It's sort of like baking a cake. If you turn the heat up, um, it's not going to get done on the inside. It's just going to burn on the outside. And that's exactly what it's like when you're doing peer-led, or you know, person-led services, Mm -hmm. is if we turn the heat up, we're actually not going to get this person where they need to be. We're just going to traumatize them. And so, and while I'm I'm sure that there are people out there that think, well, the pressure is needed, um, it's really individually based. I I had a lot of pressure put on me in, in early treatment, and, and that did help me in a way, um, although I do think there are much gentler ways that we can go about that. But so one thing, you know, it, it's not one size fits all. Well, because not all. every person is the same. No. I mean, we are all individuals, so. If, if there was, you know, uh, I think our last pit count was like 313 mm-hmm. people um, mm-hmm. in Curry County that were without housing. So if there are 313 people in Curry, there are 313 reasons why there's homelessness here in yep. Curry. Yep. Because literally there is no way for anybody's story to be similar to anybody else's. There's so much childhood um you know, not just trauma, but just childhood situations in general that guided their path that just can't be replicated. Um, and so th- that's why there's no one size fits all to helping people is because they didn't all get there the same way. And I think that if, you know, if you had a, um, quote, normal childhood, whatever, whatever, whatever that, that is, means, right, standard, whatever that is, um, you don't really know what it looks like to not have that. No. You you might you might have an idea, but you don't know what it feels like. Right. I mean, I remember you saying at one point, um, and this was months ago, that if you have one adult, just one adult in your life, mm-hmm. that will mm-hmm. that will get you through your childhood. That's, that's like the resiliency factor. Right. There is like that's one of the keys to resiliency is. Having one person in your life, um, and it doesn't have to be an adult, but certainly I think, especially when we're teenagers, we want that adult um, like acceptance mm-hmm. uh, because we want to be accepted in their world, um, you know, earlier than than we think we should be. Right. And so, yeah, there's there's a lot of uh, of that for sure. Um, and it's not hard to be that person. You know, what What I've noticed, um, and, and this has kind of happened through my life, is that, you know, people will come and, and tell me their story. And they just have always done that mm-hmm. with me. Well, I do it for sure. But there are other people that I would never think of sharing my story with, right? Mm-hmm. I would I'm just not, right? I, I There's something, I don't know. It just, it it communicates when somebody is available to mm. mentor or scaffold or, you know. It's incredible how much it makes a difference just being available. Mm-hmm. Um, like our biggest crunch right now is we just need a few people there to just listen to people. Yeah. And so we're work- working really hard to get some more funding for peers because mm-hmm. I, it's incredible how much we really just need a person in a seat to just listen to someone. Yeah. That is just as productive 
as them sitting in a seat working on goals. It 100% is just as productive because we, can, we can't even get to the goals until they're able to get through what, what's happening to them in the moment. Um, and it's usually an emotional thing it is. that has got all kinds of weird thoughts mm-hmm. wrapped up in it because when we have uh, similar experiences, we have thoughts about those experiences and that kind of puts them in stone so mm-hmm. that the next time we start to have that experience, we immediately go to that emotional place mm-hmm. that, and it it's... Yeah, it can be really rough to get out of that. That's the I think and I think we've talked about this. In fact, at the time we talked about resiliency, I think we talked about paper tigers mm-hmm. and um, which is really triggers, you know, triggers are, are paper tigers. Some triggers are harmful and the, the, those are real tigers. Those yes. Are, you know, when somebody's actually um, trying to hurt you. Right. Um, but most triggers are um, kind of not benign because they they do injure you especially emotionally um but it's not going to you know you're not physically going to die right. and so uh, but our brain doesn't know the difference Mm-mm. it just goes back to 10,000 years ago when yes. we were in the jungle and there was a saber-toothed tiger exactly and we run mm-hmm. <laughs> or and then fight you get it's why you know yeah. you you get those feelings in your gut all yep. the the blood uh, rushes away from your gut and yeah. into your muscles, so that you, especially your your butt and your legs, so you can jump up and run. And all these things happen because of saber toothed tigers ten years ago, and our body doesn't even know that's ten not happening. Thousand ten years. thousand years yeah. ago, yeah, not, not right. ten, not ten yeah. years ago, right? Yeah. I don't think so. <laughs> Do they have any? I'd love one. I don't know. I think I would love to have a pet saber toothed tiger. <laughs> but but it does feel like it's part of our DNA. It, it is. You know, it one hundred percent is. It's. I mean, those those um, evolutionary traits don't go away in thousands of years. It, right. Millions of years is what right. it takes. So, our brains, the chemical still responds the exact same way it did ten thousand years ago. So if if you know you're in a situation where you feel threatened the the natural response is what you're going to get you're going to mm-hmm. get that biological response yeah. you yep there's no yeah. i mean there's no avoiding um the initial response but you can you know catch it and scale it back and that's a right. lot of what um we do in like resiliency work and de-escalation is um bringing bringing someone back to their you know thinking brain and out mm-hmm. of their survival brain I love that. That that is just that's such a that's such an interesting topic mm-hmm. to me. I know, like the whole de-escalation thing, because I, you know, if I'm around and people are fighting or something, I I want to run. You know, mm-hmm. I don't I don't want to be there. But that doesn't facilitate de-escalation. Right. Not everybody's set up for de-escalation. Ah, not everybody is okay. a de-escalator. Maybe not. Okay. Yeah. Um, you know, and a lot, a lot of people's initial reaction is to run towards um, danger. Interestingly, when there is like interaction, human and human interaction. Okay. Some of it's curiosity. Some of it's like I can fix this. Okay. Um. And then, and then there are people who it's kind of their innate reaction to to run the other way. Yeah, and there's a place for everybody in this de-escalation <laughs> world. Uh, the ones that are just not, they're like, "Yep, that's not my gig." You know, uh, it, certainly at our agency, which we're going to be talking about uh, next week, actually, and we're working on some bringing in some de-escalation training for the whole team, mm. um, so that we actually have a de-escalation team that consists of more than just myself and and Dave usually. Um, because it, it it's not just um, who can intervene, who can step in. It's you really do need to be trained in de-escalation, and there's so many different pieces. It's body language, it's tone, it's really? everything. It's it's position of your body. It's mm-hmm. your situational awareness is critical, and so um, you cannot just run into the situation and think you can fix it. You have to. Um, I would say if your heart's racing, you're not in a place to be doing de-escalation. Really? Mm-hmm. So are you are you saying that when you de-escalate a situation, your heart is not racing? Um, I don't. I 
No. So, I mean... Because mine is going mm-hmm. like flippity, flippity, flippity. I, when, you've, when you've kind of like, especially not just when you have the training, but because um, it's not like one training and then you're done. Mm-hmm. It's a lot of training over time. It's a lot of different techniques you learn. Um, I, you know, my, my, this was part of my degree. And so there's different okay. classes that where I learned li- little parts of de-escalation. Okay. And so when you, when you put all that together and then you experience it and you practice it and you're involved in de-escalation teams, you pick up on a lot of things. So it's a really a mixture of things. So it's not just like, okay, you had a de-escalation training and now you're part of the team. Mm-hmm. Um, it's also practicing mm-hmm. because, yeah, when somebody, the, the the code word is, I need de-escalation. That's the code word. Mm-hmm. So when somebody says de-escalation um, and you're on the, the de-escalation team, mm-hmm. yeah, you have to go in there without, uh, you know, you've got to go in there with your head on straight. Wow. So you you have to, um, I, I think... It's similar to, you know, when you're working in fire and you hear the, the bell. Mm-hmm. There might be a little jump for a second, but then you're you're like on cue. Right. You're like, this is the step I take. Right. And so it's really procedural in my head. And so I don't go into it with a lot of like emotion or um, cortisol. <laughs> fascinating. Usually. Absolutely fascinating yeah. to me. I think it's just you got to like make you, it just has to be ingrained into you. It's mm-hmm. got to be a habit. Um to be able to stop and, and take a second. So, yeah, we've, we've, uh, we did kind of have a little bit of an incident last week. And so, um, that's why we're going to be talking about de escalation. And, you know, it, everybody kind of, um, it, it ended well. And like we, you know, people responded the way they were supposed to, but we did have a few newer people who weren't sure how to respond. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that's an oversight on, on us. So, we're going to be going through all of that. And, um, adding some more de-escalation training, but excellent. yeah, yeah, excellent. That's uh, a. Um, I think I, I kind of wish that everybody. It's just important in life. Yeah. I use. I mean, de-escalation. Like I have to use that for me sometimes. So, <laughs> uh, I like that. <laughs> yeah. So I, I wish everybody had a bit of that training. It'd just be so nice if, as a society, we leaned into people and talked calmly when people were upset and mm. had some situational awareness. Mm-hmm. It would just be nice. No, it would. Yeah. So have you moved into that new facility? So no. Um, <laughs> Cause boy, I, we've I had to move had that date so many cutting, times. Yeah. yeah. So we had the ribbon cutting and we thought, oh, and we thought, oh we're going um, to be open in a couple weeks. Mm-hmm. And then we there was a couple of item, large items that just we can't open without those. And one is the fence. We've got to we've got to have the fence up around because we we need a place where people can be and they can be safe. And mm-hmm. like also we we need to be able to control the uh, space, right? Um, in a way that's not like punitive for people because it's their space. We right. just need to make sure we section off what isn't so mm-hmm. that they have the rest for them. Uh, so the fence is important. And then um, you know it's kind of important to have a bathroom. And so we're waiting <laughs> yeah. for the plumbing. And I think that I, I think Adam told me that the plumber will be um, there on the, or the inspection will happen on the 18th. And so I don't think the plumbing will get done until towards the end of the month. Right. That's my assessment. So, so then we had moved the date to the 16th. And then he told me, well, the, they won't even get the inspector there till the 18th. So, um, so, so maybe October. We're hoping that early October. <laughs> we really need to open before the rains hit because yeah, because we really just like to have that space for people. Yeah, um, it's yeah. it gets, you know, it gets very stressful for everybody. They get agitated and they're just there's there's so many needs. Not everybody's prepared for the rains. Um, and then you know it's it's just daily dumping on our team. Right. So which you know we handle, but. The more we can mitigate, the better. Oh, yeah. So we're not in it yet. We're hoping to be in it um, by October. Good. Mm-hmm. Because, you you know, we did have a couple of days of rain. Yeah, we did. You know, it was kind of warm. Ago. But but, but uh-huh. interesting and wet. Uh-huh. I mean, the thing about the rain yeah. is that it's it is It's a little wet. wet. Uh, weird, and right? you don't just dry off when yeah. you've been caught in a rain shower that's and two inches worth of rain. Really, like, we're hoping to... Uh, you know, there's still some design left on the outside and a few things on the inside that we haven't kind of finished yet because we almost kind of want to get it a little bit open and start getting a little bit more ideas from people mm-hmm. before we make some of those final decisions, especially like on the garden area, what people want out there. So, um, but my 
you know, I envision us having some gazebos and some covered areas outside. Nice. Um, and then, you know, as we grow, we're going to expand. We're going to add a shower and laundry trailer. Um, Great. You know, it may not be the end of this year. It'll probably be early next year, hopefully by spring. Mm-hmm. Um, we're going to be adding, oh, we'd love to expand the footprint just a little bit. Um, we're going to also, and maybe add another bath- bathroom. That would mm-hmm. be great. Um, and then we're going to add a couple of storage units for us so that we can um, so stock up on supplies. We often right. struggle with that, with the space we're in now. <laughs> it's mostly just stacks of boxes yep. in every nook and cranny we can find. Yep. So there's going to be a lot of changes. So that'll be the Navigation Center, but it's also Peer House, which are two separate programs. So we call it Peer House Navigation Center because it's, it's really both. It's, mm-hmm. it's our navigation services, which is our case management for health-related services. And we will have our clinic over there. So we will have a clinic room that'll have, um, I mean, it'll be set up like a full a full clinic. A provider could come in there and do a full exam. We'll actually have telehealth exam equipment. Oh, we'll cool. have the only um, sexual assault exam kit in Brookings. And so we would be able to remotely do sexual assault e- exams for people in Brookings. So seriously, the police department does not have... Oh, well, it wouldn't... Yeah, it would not be appropriate for the police department. But um, the hospital, I think, has one in Gold Beach. Or maybe it's... Okay. It may not be the hospital. I, I might be speaking out of turn. But I, I know there's one in Gold Beach. Mm-hmm. But we'll have one here. And so once we get the clinic set up, um, and then we're going to be working with our provider to... Right now, we, we've kind of put our provider on pause for a few months. Mm-hmm. Just so we... She's bringing on some mental health providers. We're restructuring right. our health services and getting our clinic going. Right. Then we're going to come back together and and try to see how much more we can bring into Curry. So so that clinic will get some use then. Um, so we'll have the resource navigation and the clinic and our health services. And then on the other side, we will have uh, Peer House, which is our walk-in services. And and we we haven't had a day center in a couple of years. We had a day center for a short time, but we didn't have enough staff. We didn't have enough experience yet on the team to really manage it. And it just, it ended up not feeling like a good experience for a lot of our clients is what their feedback was Mm -hmm. um, because it just didn't feel manageable. So this, you know, we've got plenty of staff. Well, we could always use more staff, Um, but we've got enough staff now. And we do, we are looking for volunteers. And so if anybody is looking to volunteer and it's really just, you know, if you want to volunteer and you're like, I don't want to talk to people, we've got stuff you can do. If you want that interaction with people daily and you want to feel like you're helping, we've got something for you to do. And so um, if anybody does want to volunteer, you can call us 541-251-0825, or you can actually email us at volunteer at brookingscoreresponse.org. I mean, you can go on the website. There's so many ways. So we definitely are looking for volunteers for Peer House because it it does take a village. Um, Absolutely. You know, there's so many needs that we have there. Um, and we see a lot of people. We see between 30 and 50 people a day. And I, I expect that to increase once we get to the new building and people are able right. to actually hang out for the day, you know. Right. right. So, I mean, yeah. the, the the homeless population is increasing. It's not... It is increasing, yes. not decreasing. It's increasing. However, we're starting to see the dial kind of tip a little bit because... All of that funding that's been infused into the community for the last few years, especially when Governor Kotek took office, mm-hmm. and just, I mean, her, her housing initiatives have been one after the other. I mean, OHCS, Oregon Housing and Community Services, which is the, the housing branch of the state of Oregon. So the OHA, Oregon Health Authority, is the health branch. OHCS is the housing branch. You know, they're barely keeping up right now, uh, which is, it's a good problem to have, mm-hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. Um, they're definitely hiring a lot. They're training a lot. They're getting all this funding out. Um, and they're coming back and, and following up with us to see what we need or, you know, what they need from us to make sure that uh, the community knows what's going on. And now there's all these reports coming from the last couple of years of work that we've been doing with the state uh, through all these initiatives. So, you know, there's a lot of funding coming out and it's finally starting to um, make the impact. Nice. Yeah. So, you know, it was hitting the ground. Money was being spent, mm-hmm. millions of dollars being spent the first year with with not as much movement because you got to get people hired you got to get the infrastructure for your program you i mean insurance that took us 9 months to get the insurance required for this grant 
Wow. And it's nothing against our insurance broker. Mm-hmm. It's just so hard for nonprofits to get insurance right now wow. because this work is risky, yep. you know? Yep. So, um, but our work is relatively low risk, but um, in general, I think. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. So there's, it, it's finally starting to kind of saturate the stay That's and nice. we're seeing, we're seeing um, some leveling out. It, I would say it's not where it was Mm -hmm. pre-pandemic, but we're hopeful that when we do the point in time count coming this January, which also we will need volunteers for, um, we're hoping when we do the point in time count, it'll be lower this year and not because of lack of capacity to count. Right. Last year was our best year. We, We went all out. We had outreach teams for 12 hours a day. We had, um, all of the, you know, the nonprofits and then St. Timothy's that that were able to had their doors open most of the week and were doing the count and asking the surveys. And we, I mean, we pretty much nailed it last year. So Excellent. I'm confident that if we make that big of a push this year, that we'll see some accurate numbers and we'll see whether there's been a reduction or not. Now, you also have um, a transitional housing we project. Do. And, yeah. And how is that going? And it's interesting because we, so originally we went from winter shelter and then we, we got switched and we, we got this house. And so we moved to transitional housing. And a lot of the funding that's been coming from the state um, is for shelter funds. And so we were really confused for a while. And as it turns out, the project is actually a transitional shelter. So technically it, it's considered a shelter, but it's transitional. So people are, it's not like a coming and going every day, like mm-hmm. a like a typical shelter would be. So I think the word shelter, you know, scares some people, but realistically, wh- there's so many different types of shelter. And, and so what we're talking about here is one where it, it's transitional housing, essentially. Right. But um, but I want to say that because, um, you know, I use the word shelter a lot and and I don't want people to think like, oh, this is a shelter where they leave for the day and then, you know, they come back at night and it's first come, first serve. You know, the people that we're putting in the shelter, they're there until either they have to leave or they want to leave. You know, we we find them housing or or they find something on their own. So they're they're there um, until they transition. And so, it's women and children. Women and children and currently more children than women. <laughs> and it is I go there. Um, I was just there. Actually, I came from there to come here. And yeah, it's it's lovely. I there's. We've learned so much. It's only been open for a little over a month, I think. We have learned so much in this such a short period of time. You know, there, there comes a point, um, like you never want to start a program without, you know, your policies in place and you're, you're kind of, you're in basic infrastructure in place. Like, you know your budget, you know how much you can spend. But sometimes not all those pieces are all in place. And, and sometimes there's some pieces you actually can't know until you start. And this was one of those projects where, um, you know, there was some pieces of this where we're like, well, at some point we just are going to have to put our best fo- foot forward and yep. uh, see what happens and see what happens. And we knew there weren't going to be any emergencies or any major blow ups. Mm-hmm. And, and there haven't been. It's been a lot of really good learning on our part and a lot of grace from the people that we we were able to get into that house. Even, you know, today they were just like, yep, we totally understand. Um, you know, it's like, okay, the fridge stopped working. Of course it did. Um, so we got to get a new fridge. And then the generator, for some reason, started oh, running nonstop for 12 hours. And, so, and then the AC unit is just not working. So it's like all these yeah. things where we're like, oh, we're a landlord. Now we've got to <laughs> figure out how now Now we have work orders. We never had work orders wow. before. We have a process for work orders. Wow. We have a process for... Household request items, you know, mm-hmm. when they're like, hey, we want a blender. Mm-hmm. So when so- the first time somebody came to us and said, we'd like something for the house. We'd like some gardening tools. Mm-hmm. We were like, this isn't case management because it's not their <laughs> tools. They want it for the house. So, again, it's just us going, yeah. oh, yeah, we need a household request form so that people can request things for the house and they stay with the house for the next people to enjoy. Right. And so um, it's been really interesting. Um and like I said, I just, I appreciate their grace so much. And it's, it's also been like, it feels very full circle for me and some of, some of our team that have been through programs like this and have been in shared living. And so when, when, you know, the, the um, residents are 
kind of coming up. We have a house meeting every week where they 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 attend the house meeting. They have input. We we take minutes. We you know share important things with them, um, and they get really you know they're they're very involved in this, um, and they're they've definitely given us um, they've definitely given us a lot of feedback in the way that um, they appreciate the house. They appreciate how much we've, how much time we've put into this. Um, and so, yeah, so when we have those meetings, uh, we, we talk to them about like changes that are coming up and, um, they usually, um, we actually, I, we had our house meeting yesterday and, um, a couple of the kids were there and like, it's so nice for me to like, I remember back when I was in like our shared living space and like it's really nice to see the kids there and like in this safe space and this safe environment and you know mom is just grateful she's yeah. just so grateful um and so anyway so a lot of what we we've been talking to them about is um you know this there's a scarcity mentality that if you're if you live in poverty or you live certainly if you live on the street um, there's a lot of scarcity mentality because you don't have enough. You never have enough. I mean, a lot of us never have enough and and we have means. Um, like I have means and I, I just never can. It's just never enough. So when you don't have anything, um, it's uh, it becomes a trauma. It, it becomes one of those paper tigers and sometimes a real tiger because you need food to live <laughs> and you yep. need shelter to live often. Yep. Uh, so when people are out there for a long period of time and it's like chronic homelessness, which is really, you know, more than a year or two. Yeah. Especially if you've gone in and out of it, because then you have triggers of right. losing housing. So um, a, a lot of times what happens is, especially with this house, because we're we're so new to this, you know, it's like, well, we we didn't have enough. We, we maybe bought a resource, but we didn't buy enough for everybody or or we didn't think about how quick it would go. And so the only like, you know, um, difficult interactions that everybody's had there is over resources. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of our conversation with them has been, hey, if something breaks here, we're going to fix it. You don't have to live in a broken place and we're not going to kick you out for it. Wow. Um, and, you know, if your kids are loud, we're not going to come down on you for that and um if somebody if, if we buy something for the house and somebody uses it all up don't you know don't get upset with them come to us tell us you want it too because we'll get it for you okay. so we don't want people turning on each other right for the lack of resources because right. that's what happens out in the streets that's yeah. what happens in our poverty stricken areas and it creates so much uh more tension and violence than there needs to be. And so we want to help them get rid of the scarcity mentality. And so really a lot of our conversations have just been reassuring them because there's so much trauma. Yeah. And reassuring them that, hey, it's okay. Like put in, you write down the work order that that screen broke. We'll fix it. Mm -hmm. We'll fix it as soon as possible. We're not even going to say anything to you right. about it. Right. So um, it's been a, it's been a learning experience emotionally too. Yeah. For I'm all sure. of us. We've. I'm sure. We've all, um, especially if you have lived experience, yeah, you know. and pretty much everybody mm -hmm. on our team does. Right. So, you know, we all see the gratitude, we all see the struggle. Um, so, yeah, it that the shelter's going well, the the house is functioning well. Like everybody's kind of starting to get into a groove. Good, you know, Good. figure out okay who's doing what chores, and I mean it's a whole mm -hmm. thing. Good. So. And what about Gold Beach? You've got a yeah, um, that's <laughs> the veterans that project is, up there. It's like a stone that we just let go downhill. It's <laughs> it is there is no stopping that. Wow. Um, yeah, uh, I just wrote a check today for over a hundred thousand for oh for our. Um, we've got concrete going in, and we've got the community center going up. So we had a, a hot tank there, which is a hot oil tank. Hot is literally the H O T hot oil tank. So we had a hot. Um, underneath the motel and not directly under it was kind of a little bit to the side uh -huh. and under the ground and you know just like a foot or two down but it's a environmental hazard and so you know when we found out 
when we were we were still waiting to to complete this grant, you know, we applied for the grant August 22nd of last year, 2023. And then we were we had a conditional approval, meaning here's you were approved the grant, but only if you complete these items. And it was like something like 50 or 60 items we oh, had to work. It took us from October until um, April yeah. to complete <laughs> all of those requirements for the state to to wow. get the final award. Now we've got the final award. Um, but at the end of that, right as we were getting cl- close to the end to get the final award is when we did the scan and found this hot tank. And so, boy, the state was really spinning on that. Um, they were like, you know, what, have you heard about this hot tank? Are you going to still move forward with the project? And we're like, yeah, of course we are. <laughs> we're we're going to mitigate it like everybody else would. It's just a hot so tank. It's just a tank. Yeah. You know, this has probably come up before. Right. So um, it turns out it comes up all the time. Isn't yeah. that interesting? So, yeah. so yeah, we, we, the hot tank was easy to, there was nothing in it. Um, there was Great. no contamination. They Great. mitigated that. And then we, um, I went up there last week or maybe it was the week before. Um, I think it was the week before to check on some progress and go talk to Adam. And, you know, while I was up there, they had um, the plumbers in there putting, laying the pipe for the community center under the gravel. Mm -hmm. And we had a lot of stuff to go over. And he's like, you know, we're tamping rocks here. You got your boots on? Let's talk and tamp at the same time. So so it's going. I mean, he'll if you go up there, he's going to put you to work. (laughs) Uh, So I try not to go up there too much. when but, do you yeah. think it's going to open? Well, we it, it'll probably be a year before everything's complete, but we anticipate getting lease up and getting some people in there within a few months because some of those units are just going to be so easy to wow. get the kitchens in and get them up to speed. Right. Um, so, it, you know, that's really more of an Adam question because the timeline, you know, it, I know that things change so much and he's got his eye on that and I can't even begin to understand what all he has to do but um, it would be good to have something in place by winter well we won't have anything by this not not that i'm aware of but again you know that really um it i you know adam and i've talked about it and he he does throw out some kind of timelines but Mm -hmm. they change yeah and so i have no idea really um other than i know within a year we'll have everything complete and open because we have to so um, and the city of Gold Beach is very cooperative. Oh, so they've been lovely. In yeah. fact, we originally got, we just got the water set up. And I think they were charging for 10, 10 um, uh, waste, uh, what do you, I forget what you call that. But yeah. basically like 10 units worth. Mm-hmm. And it was quite a bit of money. And so we called them and we're like, hey, you know, we, we're actually not using any of that right, right now. It's all under construction. We might use one bathroom. Uh, during construction. So they actually lowered it all to, they're just going to get one fee right now until until we're ready to go. I mean, everything that we've talked to them about, they've been great. And we're going to be working with Gold Beach Main Street on the pocket park up front. Nice. And I'm looking at some of the uh, architect drawings for the um, parking lot over there that we're going to lease some to Ace Hardware because, I mean, they've had a hard time with parking. Hmm. So it's really, I mean, it's just, it's been a community project. It's so lovely to have Everybody has just jumped in and said, what can we do right. to help? And that's such so refreshing. And and so amazing. It you is. Know? I mean, it feels it so good. It does. Yeah. You're all pulling in the same direction. Yeah. And we're going to do, you know, it's, I don't think it'll be a groundbreaking because we've already broken ground yes. for sure. <laughs> but um, we're going to do some kind of ribbon cutting, mm-hmm. I think, around Veterans Day, mm-hmm. which is in November. Right. Is that November? 11th. 8th, 11th. Yeah. So um, I've got a. I've got to get on the ball and start getting people invited. We're going to invite people from the governor's office Great. and from um, OHCS, the housing department. Mm-hmm. And, of course, you know, everybody from the community, we want to get um, – we really want this to be a community celebration because this is such a, a big deal around here. Everybody's very excited. I mean, yes. even, on, right. even online, which is – Facebook's historically negative. Yes. Um, it's just been such a positive response. Oh, that's so just great. I know. Like, yeah. that's, we needed this. I know, right? Yeah. 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 <laughs> Are there any, um, have there been any thoughts about winter shelter? There have. So there's some conversations right now because the funding from last year got renewed and actually increased. And right. uh, we're, we're able to use that for Project Turnkey for uh, the the transitional house that we have right now um, because it does qualify under shelter. But 
it's such a lower cost. Weird. It's such a lower cost to own the shelter mm-hmm. than it is to rent an entire motel. Mm-hmm. So, um, so we actually have quite a bit more funding than we need for the units that uh, we are required to have. Mm-hmm. So we actually are talking right now about opening up some additional units um, because we can only have women and children in the house, so right. we could open up additional units for everybody else. Um, so, yeah, that, that conversation's happening. I would anticipate uh, we'll know by the end of September, early October, and if we go ahead and move forward, we would open November. Excellent. So Excellent. we'll definitely um, update. And and I am not the only person updating our, our website anymore. That's so oh, nice. I know, oh, right? <laughs> it's like, I don't know, it's like, people work with me or something um yeah it's amazing when you have staff (laughs) i know i've taken off so many hats yeah it's great so uh you know we don't we're not we don't have a fluid process yet so they're still a little bit clunky um but i'll get updates as soon as i know as far as the shelter i'll make sure that they're on there and on our facebook right um but and if anybody has any questions certainly they can come down and ask or call um, the number, which again, 541-251-0825, if you want to volunteer, if you have questions. Um, and, you know, I'm usually running around and busy a lot, but uh, Cindy and June take great messages. And <laughs> yeah. um, and they're wonderful. They people. are wonderful. They are just delightful. They're, it's like yeah. it's like having a room of like other me's, but they're better than me. <laughs> <laughs> they're great. They're yeah. just great. Yeah. So another thing that you are, you know, maybe kind of branching off into is some consulting work. Yeah, it's 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 funny. Um, Like I had such narrow visions for myself, um, you know, gosh, what was it? Maybe eight years ago, seven years ago when I started thinking about this organization. Um, And it's just bloomed, really. Uh, Sometimes just beyond my comprehension. And this, you know, there's been a lot of um, talk about different types of trainings that us as an organization can offer. And there's certainly a lot of things that I personally can offer. And, um, and then, you know, having started an organization and having gotten it to where it is now, um, I don't want to, I don't want those skills to, to go unused, you know, Mm -hmm. especially in this community. Uh, Those of us who, who have the ability to do this kind of work, we we want to stay in it for as long as we can because we know that it's a learning curve and it's hard to get for people to get going. So I've had a lot of people reach out to me over the years uh, asking how to start a nonprofit, which you know I don't inherently know how to start nonprofits. I could I did start one, um, but there are a lot of things that I do know how to do to help um, nonprofits and other organizations maybe put in some infrastructure or you know um, write for grants or things like that, and then. Then there's training. There's, you know, team training and there's um, kind of like group education, which is a totally separate topic. But that we've done within the agency uh, for our own staff for several years. And I facilitate our trainings, although I am working with um, staff to put together their own training modules because I have um, like a template module that I use to put together trainings. And it's so empowering to put together your own training mm-hmm. on something you know mm-hmm. and to teach other people about it in a yeah. way that's like effective and meaningful. So that's, I, you know, I would love also for the team to start doing stuff like that. But but I've been doing it for a while and I, I've done it for um, several of the organizations around here. I've done um, training on moral injury, which we've talked about a few times on here. I've done training for microaggressions, which um, I think we've also talked about on here. And I have some modules for that and like some series modules. And so recently I was asked to do one for All Care Health. And so I traveled over to um, Grants Pass on Tuesday and did it for um, quite a few of their staff over there. And we t- what are microaggressions? Microaggressions, it's like... It's kind of the everyday, um, you know, it's it's not really like the big blow up stuff. It's sort of these everyday like indignities that people from marginalized groups suffer um, just usually by like offhand comments. And when I say uh, like people from marginalized group, I mean groups that have historically not been 
uh, at the table making decisions, groups that have not been in positions of power or privilege. And so it's they can't brush it off as easy. It actually impacts them. And so microaggressions are, are really, um, there's all different types of microaggressions. And I think during the training, we didn't touch on all of them, but we kind of talked about um, backhanded compliments. So that's one where, you know, like if you were, I, I've heard them myself talking, you know, somebody's talking to a person of color and they're like, oh, you're very articulate. Mm. And it's an interesting comment because it could be a microaggression and it could not be. It could, mm-hmm. be, a, could be a compliment. Mm-hmm. But oftentimes when we're talking about microaggressions, we're talking about people who are saying that, speci- white people, people that look like you and I, saying that to people that aren't white um, and it's more of a surprise that they're articulate. And um, because so, it's not expected. It, right. Yeah. Right. So it's it's an unconscious bias. It's yep. really describing our unconscious bias and it just kind of comes out our mouth. Mm-hmm. Um, and a lot of people have that really like open mouth, insert foot kind of moment. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, but sometimes we don't even realize it's a, we, that we're doing it. We don't even realize we should be inserting our foot. So yes. uh, what I the training that I do, it's not just what is a microaggression. It's actually how to respond to correction as Ooh. as a white person, as a person um, in a position of privilege. Hmm. So my training is this is what microaggressions are. But also here's what to do when you're called out because you will be. Everybody will be at some point. And we can either turn a blind eye to it, we can get aggressive, or we can lean in and Mm. we can take it in. And that doesn't feel good usually the first few times, Mm. sometimes every time for some people, Um, especially if you're someone who's really kind. You don't want to be thought of as mean. Right. And so... And you don't want to think of yourself as being mean. Right. And so I often, you know, go into these... uh, I don't call them trainings. It's really a group education. And I learn too. Mm-hmm. Um, it's popular education style. So so we're really building off of what they already know. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, yeah, so um, basically we, we talk about how the comments that uh, people make. Uh, oh, there was, there was a few others too. So a couple of those were like jokes and comments. I think you know, that's a really common one is people joking. Um, and it's still a microaggression, but they kind of laugh it off. Like, you know, s- like saying that maybe uh, um, somebody who is hired that's Latino is a diversity hire. And it's a joke, you know. Yeah, and it's not a very funny joke. Right. And sometimes yeah. they themselves make those jokes mm-hmm. um, and we kind of play off of that. Right. Uh, but I, it's not really our place. And so. Yeah. So talking about microaggressions, we kind of talked about like different types of microaggressions. Um, There's also some stereotypical assumptions like, um, you know, there was a work environment that I was in that I was frequently asked to make copies um, by someone who we had the exact same job. Hmm. And making copies wasn't a part of our job unless it was something we needed. Mm -hmm. And so um, I had to and this person was male and I frequently had to tell them that actually that was not a part of my job. Um, and it, what sucks is that it's fascinating. It, it's on the onus is on the person. The onus is on the victim. Yes. Usually. And so the more we talk about this, the more we're taking that pressure off of people who, I mean, I, I can't tell you how many times every single time, every single time I do this one, there's always somebody, and I mean, they're always white, it's typically male, but there's always someone who's white that speaks up and says, I've said that, and I didn't think it was a microaggression. Always. It happens every time. And then we get to go into conversations about about that. And then they're like, well, but I didn't mean it that way. So then we talk about impact versus intent and how those things are different. Um, because your your intent is what you mean to do, and your impact is is the actual Actually reaction. Actually happened. And yeah. so we can't keep leaning on what we mean. Right. Um when there's actual damage. so the, Because yeah. there's no way for somebody to be inside your head and to know that right. you meant something right. different than right. what came out of your mouth. And not only that, but like it it, w- it would never, it doesn't matter if that's, if your intention was good or not. The, it, it doesn't mitigate and it also doesn't address um, what microaggressions are, which microaggressions like feed off of 
the um, generational trauma, mm-hmm. typically. Mm-hmm. So when somebody is saying, you, you hurt me, like through a microaggression, what they're actually saying is, you hurt me in a way that people like you have hurt people like me for mm-hmm. generations. Mm-hmm. And I've witnessed it. And so now it's hurting me the same way. And so that's really what they're saying. Mm-hmm. They just maybe can't articulate that because they shouldn't have to. Right. Um, and also it that's what paper tigers are, is they we go into fight or flight and you know. Right. So a lot of what I talk about is the steps to, you know, what to do when you've been called out. And, you know, we certainly don't have enough time to go through this training. Right, right. And I would love to do it for if there's agencies or businesses yeah. out there that want to do it. Yep. I would love to. Yep. Um, the one that I think I always say uh, when I'm going through the training, I always say, oh, this is the most important one to every one of them because I think they're so <laughs> important. And they are. They are. <laughs> um, but the one that I really want to call out before we um, end here is when uh, – it's not that person, that person did not, like if you if you do perpetuate a microaggression and, and they call you out, just because they called you out, they're not offering to be your teacher. Go learn on your own time. They didn't volunteer to be your teacher, especially when they shouldn't have to calm themselves down to teach you. In fact, if they want to go off on you and get it out of their system, they might just need to do that. But so that and, and you know, understanding it on your own time. Go look it up when you have time and don't expect uh, people that you've hurt to be your teacher. So that's the one that I really want to stress the most to people is um, that you do your own work. I think it's it, it's remarkable. Um, and when I first started hearing about microaggressions and started looking at what some of the things that were that I said unconsciously, right? Yeah. Unconsciously. It's it's uh it it kind of makes you go, what? Yeah. What did I what where did I oh boy. Yeah. And, That's interesting. And as women, I think we can relate to that. Yes. We can't know it. Right. You know, we I certainly I can't know what it's like to to hear that daily you know, that Daily crap, <laughs> essentially, mm-hmm. yep. um, from society. I can't know, uh, at, like for a person of color, but I, but I can know what it's like as a woman to experience microaggressions from men when they, they're That's wonderful, not the yeah, exactly. and they're wonderful men, and they don't mean and yes, but it until systematically, until the system is different yeah. and the the playing field is equal for. Je- several generations. Yep. So it's you know it's certainly not going to happen in our time, but until that system is is even for generations, um, we just won't get there completely. But it's a step. So Diana, we've uh, run out of time. How exciting! <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> I know. And we will we will do this yeah. again. We will pick up because I I want to yeah, talk more. Yeah, we didn't more. even get I know too far into My it. Yeah. Microaggressions and that stuff are is really interesting, and yeah. and I want to do that. So. Thank you for coming on. I appreciate yeah. you making the time. It was lovely. Thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely. And I want to thank our listeners for tuning in. If you want to actively support community radio, visit our website, kciw.org. We always need people with recording and editing skills. Volunteer your time, become a show sponsor or a station underwriter. That's kciw.org. I'm Candace Michelle, and this is Our Community.